Cool. So, um, Tint Wisdom number 73, I'm joined with Rob Oranges. How you doing, Eric? Good. How are you? I'm great. So, I wanted to say Rob Oranges from Denco Sales, but I feel like it's really Rob Oranges from a lot more than Denco, just Denco Sales, not minimizing that in any way. But, um, you know, you've obviously worked for um, a long time in the window film industry. So, I think that's probably a great place to start is starting it kind of at the beginning how did you get into this industry and and kind of get us from there to here yeah yeah um that was 28 years ago now give or take um so i used to um I used to have a bad snow skiing habit um i raced competitively on the fis circuit and uh so when summer would roll around um like everybody i'd be cash poor and i can't remember who it was but somebody said you know you ought to try window tinting those guys make a ton of cash all summer and then you go back and ski when the winter started. So, um, I did, I started working for a shop. It was a little rough because they already had like, I don't know, three or four automotive installers. Those guys were on commission. They were just banging out cars. Um, they were really good. Um, but because it was commission and kind of competitive, they didn't really want to teach me how to tin a car. So I had to sit there and just watch and I'd get fed a car and then I'd hack away on it. And it was kind of brutal at first. And it was, uh, heat shaping was just kind of getting started. So we were piecing in back windows. And then, um, all of a sudden one guy started using a, a heat gun. And so I grabbed onto it and it kind of went from there. But, um, I think it was, uh, not too long where I got tired of getting in the back of cars and they gave me a roll of film and said, Hey, we got a automotive customer that wants their commercial door done. Can you go do it? And, um, I went and did the door mm -hmm. and, uh, I left, I, I figured out how to do it. It looked good. Customers totally happy. So I walked out of there and went to the next, um, they were like these little office complexes. I went to the next one to the right, told them, Hey, check this out. Sold that door went to the one to the left, did the same thing. And then it was like flat glass was started from there on. So got in the flat glass, um, the shop I was working for didn't really want to do it. So I, we, um, kind of separated on good terms. Uh, I just said, Hey, I want to chase it down. I'll do your jobs for you if you ever want to. And mm -hmm. it, uh, turned into running my own company, sold that eventually, um, got into distribution, film design, um building modeling it just it just took off um and then of course window film being what it is it's such a great product um eventually i got introduced to denco sales and the nice thing about that is like you said um i do just about everything we sell about twenty five thousand different products and i don't i don't sell them all but we we are very diversified so um it's nice to be able to bring that to other companies and share it with other companies and watch them adjust and start carrying products they normally wouldn't um and just great to be in different spaces but that's kind of what it was in the nutshell yeah right i before think the internet hit right before the internet hit right <clears throat> yeah we didn't have all this you know like tent whiz we didn't have the forums or uh the groups on facebook you just had to go grab a knife and a spray bottle and go go figure it out and hope somebody would help you along the way Right. And the, the communicate, like the ability to communicate as a group, um, I feel like is, is a huge part of what drives the industry forward and like the innovation and, and oh, growth yeah. and so on. So, you know, it, it just it goes to show you like how much value comes from being around the right people, whether it be online or whether it be in person or any way. We obviously have technology, but what I'm getting at is like um, back to what you were saying, the value of like Denco carrying so many products. That's a huge resource for a company because as a company, you're always trying to grow. You're always trying to find new opportunities. And like I know from personal experience with Denco that that's it works. It's it's a smooth way. Like when you have a, somebody who knows about window film but can also answer your questions about other related products, signage, graphics and so on. So, um, so yeah, I, I really want to drive that point home because I feel like there's a huge value in getting products from a company like Denco versus company that just does window film not to say there's anything wrong with that but there's a value there 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's nice because, you know, what I bring to the table window film wise with some experience, there's there's the equivalent of me in equipment Mm -hmm. and signage and LED um, and and all the different divisions we have. So um, we can put an expert in front of everyone. And, you know, whether it's a distributor like us or or a full blown window film manufacturer, the the value of having somebody that works there that's that's been in your shoes, that's you know had to do warranty work, for instance, um, you've got somebody that knows what you're up against, um, rather than somebody that's just sitting at a desk and they've never installed the product before. They don't even know it has a liner on it, or um, so a lot of value there. For sure. So I want to kind of jump back. To when you, yeah, you know, I didn't know you had a company that you sold. I kind of want to jump back there. I'm curious, did you sell that company as an opportunity to um, move forward? Like, was it an opportunity to sell the company that that led to that sale, or was it um, to move to a different opportunity, or what was? Was it a lifestyle choice? Um, uh, it was kind of all of the above. I was getting bored with window film, actually. Um, uh, you know, the early '90s. Um, there was a pretty cool product that came out. Um, I think it was Mark Sharfstein that brought it around. It was called Solus. And it was totally different from anything that we were. So we were selling silver or bronze and flat glass. Those are kind of your two choices. Eventually, dual reflectives came out, um, which was really nice. Um, and then this crazy clear product that knocked out all this heat and IR. Um, but it was super expensive. And we didn't know how to sell it. Um, probably, you know, cost us more than we were selling jobs per square foot for. So um, trying to figure out how to do that. And there just wasn't anything different that came along. So I, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll sell it and, you know, venture out and do something else. I sold it to the, uh, the automotive company that I started working for. <laughs> nice. And uh, they bought it from me, um, went back in and managed it for a while. I was starting a family at the time. So that was kind of a better setup for me. Uh, then, and then, um, one of the uh, manufacturers that we were working with, um, their distributor had an opening, uh, and it was growing and everything. And I, I just thought that was like the next challenge, um, for me personally, I really thought flat glass at the time just had such a, um, a potential to it that was just not even being tapped into. And so I wanted to get into building modeling. I wanted to learn as much as I could about that, that and, and, you know, what products were coming down the pipeline that would solve some of those problems. So it was just kind of a progressive thing for me. So you're without a doubt an expert at flat glass, building modeling, glass types, all that. So I'm curious, like, where do you see that fitting in? Like you mentioned how you saw such a big opportunity previously. Um, where do you think we're at like with a like life cycle of opportunity and, and how do you think that opportunity relates to, to tin shops? Because, you know, I feel like there's a variety of different types of commercial and residential uh, jobs. Residential, I feel like within a smaller um, box. But when you say commercial, you know, there's small commercial that any tin shop's pretty much capable of handling. And then there's commercial that sounds amazing because it's multiple buildings and it's hundreds of thousands of square feet, but maybe that's not in any way a fit for a regular tin shop. So like, how do you see that all, um, playing out? Is there, is it all riches at the bigger scale or is that a different business or what do you think? Um, I mean, everything has its place. I I, I think everybody kind of dreams of grabbing that quarter million square foot job, you know, bagging it and, making a lot of money on it, but you really got to build up into that kind of business because it's a long sales cycle. So you're not going to go out tomorrow, cold calling and and get one. It'd be really rare. Um, Nor would you always have a company that's geared for it. If you're doing a lot of automotive right now and you got to pull all your auto guys off to do that big project, you're just, you know, taken from one part of your business to get another part. So that's, that's not great. It, it's nice to kind of ease into it and build a division in your company that specializes in it. That small to medium sized commercial has a quick turnaround, quick cash flow, which is really important because you got to build your cash reserves. Because unless you have a really good partner on the supply side that'll help you finance the big stuff, you're, you're going to be stuck 
you know, flipping credit cards or whatever. And um, that's a challenge. But uh, I mean, it's there. Um, I'm trying to think back like 2005. I remember just a massive residential market, um, just residential as far as the eye could see, top dollar. Um, everything was going great. And then the economy bit the dust in 08. And it was almost all commercial. And the big driver there was, you know, in a commercial building, you have all this expense. You have uncontrollable expense, like, you know, employees and cost of product and stuff. And then you have what's controllable. And that's your, that's your energy consumption. And that could be up to 30, 33% um, expenses that you, you could alter, you could change. And uh, when you look at the building shell, itself the envelope um windows are literally one of the biggest holes in there draining money and energy and so forth and so we're we're like in a perfect position to take care of that because uh i think the doe said one time over 75 percent of the existing glass out there was underperforming so you know in 08 it was like go get it um and so a lot of our customers were were commercially driven Mm -hmm. um automotive sprung back up after all that and and a lot of people have been in that space um but i think with this big hit to the world economy we're going to circle back around again um because you can't help right now but but manage your expenses companies are looking for ways to reduce it and um if they have portfolios of buildings and properties then you've got to take a hard look at that and see how you can make them efficient so when you talk about commercial properties that are looking for efficiency, so like energy savings, like to me, energy savings and window foam kind of go synonymous, like with flat glass, especially like the term energy savings. To me, though, I feel like it's less effective the smaller you get. I mean, it, meaning like I don't think like I feel like small homeowners, like they're pretty much looking for heat reduction or privacy. Um, small commercial, typically something like that, privacy as well, or maybe they have windows that are causing glare. Do you, is there a kind of a, a teetering point where you start to see energy efficiency, meaning just in the power bill be, being a bigger focus? Is that with, you know, like you said, properties that are managed by people who have multiple properties or am I kind of wrong and you see that in smaller projects as well? Where like energy is- yeah, like yeah, I, I mean, you've got a point in each space is like residential, you know, they're doing their windows to gain back that living room they can't sit in at their favorite part of the day, or they're trying to protect and extend the life of their interiors because they bought a house, they filled it with nice furniture, and now the sun's tearing it all up. So, you, you know, those are those are no-brainers. Right now, it's a little challenging because some people are probably have this intrepidation about letting people into their homes. Mm-hmm. Um you know, small commercial, I, I always look at that as like, I, I call it kind of storefront. Um, mm-hmm. You know, storefront's got to protect the assets in the storefront. And um, for solar film, that's, again, fade reduction, maybe some comfort. Um, and then you've got people that own properties. And those properties, um, depending on how they're set up, they're, they're either an expensive building to occupy or they're efficient. And they cost the tenant less or they cost the property owner less. And in window foam's great there, um, it, it, but you know it's kind of evolving. It's you know now with things like riots that are going on and stuff, people are looking at safety security film. I see a lot of that marketing happening. Sure, um, glass inserts like you know the riot glass product and, and so forth. So it's kind of you know evolving past just energy efficiency there's there's more things to bolt onto your building so to say you know you bring up riot glass it's been on my mind the last couple days like brad campbell no question has been successful in window film like definitely like a standout um achiever and just now right now thinking about riot glass it's like if you couldn't have hit if he couldn't have hit the nail more perfectly (laughs) on the head like yeah standing in the front of the line (laughs) I mean, just the name, the solution, the whole thing, like, it was, it's pretty much a perfect hit. Like, like, sh- like he took the shot and waited a little while, and then the shot came down and it nailed the target. Yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of that, Eric, right now. I, I don't just, you know, see that product as an opportunity. As, you know, we mentioned safety and security film. Um, probably anti-graffiti's in there somewhere. 
for sure. Um, cause people are wandering up and down the streets, just causing mayhem. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, you know, because of COVID-19, there's just a massive, um, I guess you call it safety signage market emerging. Mm -hmm. And it's really not a hard thing for a window film company to, to kind of morph into that mm -hmm. space because we're, it, it's a sticker. Mm -hmm. And we're adhering it to something, and that's you, you know that's our space. We we do it on cars, we do it on buildings. Now we can put it on a floor, on a counter, um, MCM board. Um, it, there's all that opportunity. So, talking about that, what what do you think? Like, if, if if you're a window film company now doing auto, and then some some residential, some flat glass residential commercial, and you kind of want to take advantage of that, that's you know, like you said, safety signage, stickers, kind of. You know, you're not um, necessarily doing sides of buildings, but you're just doing the stuff in small commercial. What do you what what is the investment? What does somebody essentially need to get going, in your opinion? Um, yeah, I, you know, you're kind of familiar with it because you've been down that road in the past is is you need to get a printer, mm -hmm. um, a laminator um, for some things uh, is a must have um, and and a plotter um, are your three basic pieces of equipment. Um Twenty thousand dollars can handle it. Oh, you know what? Um, right now, um, the uh, printer manufacturers are bending over backwards to help people get in the business. I just, um, I just got the HP um, kind of sales kit for this month, and it's it's big. I'm still trying to digest it, but you can basically get into an HP latex machine for under twelve thousand dollars right now, wow. and um, you've got no payments for up to 90, 90 days um, if you qualify uh, for financing. Uh, Roland's doing something very similar. They're doing uh, six months, $99 payments. Wow. Um, there's all these uh, rebates and opportunities going on. And so really what you want to do, whether it's us or you know somebody like us, is, is talk to our equipment folks that that go through this day in and day out. They've been in the business and they can kind of look at your company and what you'd like to do and make some recommendations so you don't go, you know, making decisions that you regret. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of a planned entry. They know the deals that are going on right now. Um, the equipment industry is kind of funny. I, I've, you know, been sort of in it for the last five years and I'm learning that. You know, there's basically hard costs there, and they're all, no matter who you buy it from, you're pretty much going to pay about the same thing. You might get a few little add-ons here and there, um, but it's the follow-through afterwards. If your machine breaks, right. is your supplier an authorized repair center? Right. We are. Um, you know, can they put you in touch with training? There's a lot of really cool uh, training webinars going on right now. And, you know, to what you do with video, um, some of these uh, equipment manufacturers are doing the same thing as they're, they're leveraging the video online, bringing people into a room and, and doing what we normally would go there in person to do. And yeah. it's just as effective. Yeah, that's really cool. Cause, and what you just said, I mean, all the printers probably and all the cutters cut and print when they're brand new right before you buy it and then for some time after you buy it. But the question is, like you said, is it going to break? When it breaks, who's going to repair it? How quickly are they going to repair it? And um, what kind of support can you get on figuring out how to troubleshoot issues? Because that's that's the whole thing. So like, it's not really about finding like a, a great printer. It's about finding like a very commonly used printer that's going to have act and give you access to those resources, printers and uh, plotters and laminate. Yeah. And stuff. I a knowledgeable rep's going to also tell you, you know, how, how to use it and, and make, you know, the lifespan go as far as it possibly can, where if you misuse it, you're going to break it. Right. Um, I, I One of the things that I saw and I kind of learned is, you know, some people will get into um, the printing and signage industry. And so they'll buy a piece of equipment and, you know, let's say it's a Roland. And then after a while, they'll buy another piece of equipment and they'll get like an HP for something you just and then they'll get a third machine <laughs> Go ahead. from somewhere else and then they'll get this huge job and they'll want to use all three machines to print basically the same color and have it match got it, it doesn't work that way right. <laughs> so you know that's where having that input early on to to build the plan 
yeah. to go out and execute, that's it, it's invaluable to have someone that knows the business real well. Agreed. And because you, you, you need the equipment if you're going to get started. You don't want to be saying, well, I'm going to get started, but I, I'm going to do it without the equipment because you need the equipment. Kind of need to know what you're going to need before you yeah. need it. I mean, you could go to a you know kind of a middleman that's got a piece of equipment. At, at most shops that that invest in a printer, um, one of the ways they start to pay for it is they go out to all their competitors and they print work for them. Sure. And sure. Um, and then they've got their own clients that they do work for, and that's where they're making the bigger margin on top of it uh, for. But you, you know, you can you can use kind of a middleman like that. You're going to pay more. But eventually, if you can get a good plan going, you can get your own machine. And then, um, you, you know, you've had a printer before. You, you can do all kinds of things with it. You can do everything from stickers to perf to um, printing on on fabric um, for various things. I, I've seen uh, on flatbeds, I've seen them run a door through a flatbed and actually print a Fender guitar on fire on a door. Wow. Um, so, yeah. you know, sky's the limit. There's, there was no shortage of opportunities um, to pair graphics with window film. It just seemed like it, it was you're always going into a newly opened restaurant or newly going to open office and they needed distraction markers. Or they needed their numbers to their store, their hours or their something like there was just never a shortage. I feel like it was such a it's such a good like a. Uh, add on that like if you're not doing it you're doing flat glass you might as well just jump in in my opinion do you right have... well go ahead well when you mentioned window film i mean you can make your own window film and it, it's not that hard to do now the media is getting better the printers are getting better and faster and oh. um so now you know if you've got a client and you're doing a custom graphic for them. Let's, you know, let's just say it's a deco film that you're printing. Let's say it's dots, mm -hmm. you know, on there, and you're putting it on conference rooms. And you know, everything comes back for a rebid. And if you're using, and you know, not to our suppliers that we we buy and sell deco film for, they've got great products. Um, but those things can be bid on and put out for bid by many companies. If you're custom printing your own film. Now all of a sudden, that's something that's very hard to duplicate. So when it comes time to redo, you got you, it. You pretty much got the job, or to repair, you pretty much have that job. So mm -hmm. um, you just kind of put things into your own hands, I guess. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the 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 people with a lot of money to spend, oftentimes, not always, um, want something very specific. So like we'd always find ourselves printing out shades on, like shades of blue on frost. Or on dusted crystal and then you're bringing the customer just little shades of it they pick one and then you go well now it's time to price the job like who who else is printing shades of blue on dusted crystal and can turn it around in a week or whatever you just kind of limited your customers options to you and you know it no longer becomes about price so right right yeah and um i you know it's times are it's weird. I, I'm kind of, kind of calling 2020 the un year, where you know it's unprecedented. Um, things are undetermined, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, unsure. Uh, you know, you just go on and on and on. But the, you know, with all of that kind of negativity, there's all these opportunities there. Um, if you want to get in the print business, and if um, you know you've got one of these disaster loans, and you can legally put the money to that at a low interest rate um you can just get a rock and deal on a piece of equipment right now and off you go um mm -hmm. and and kind of had this i guess if you let you know like a tripod has several legs if your business is just a mono it's just sitting on one thing when when times are tough and things shake it tips over real easy but mm -hmm. you have it based on many different things it's more of the tripod effect you can you can hold up a lot better i you know, middle of March, when things started shutting down, we had to figure out, you know, first of all, we wanted to protect our employees. That was really important. We had a community responsibility to protect our customers and the general public at large. So um, in, in California, we shut down. We've got eight warehouses and um, three of them in California. So we shut those down right away. 
and had to determine whether we were a, an essential business. And um, it was established that we are essential to the national supply chain for safety signage, street graphics, and so forth. And you know, who would have thought that that would just blow up because now everybody needs, um, you know, a face shield on their counter. So, you know, all the MCM board we were carrying, the R4, the R6, just selling out, out like crazy. Um, people were calling us for um, PETG 7 mil um, anti-fog. So they were making their own face shields. Um, and people were adjusting. And, and the nice thing is, is as a supplier, we could keep up with them. Um, and so it's just looking for ways to adjust your business. Even if you've got something that's working right now, automotive's kind of still doing really, we're super busy on the automotive side. Um, and maybe you just need to adjust that flat glass portion of your business to keep that, that going. Yeah. I feel like that sort of like change diversity, um, opportunity, like it, it's like a muscle in a way where you want to be comfortable with new things and, and, and trying new things and expanding in different directions. So like you said, when the time comes that you absolutely have to, it's something you're familiar with. Um, because it is, I don't know, it's like an, it's an experience thing. Um, you mentioned automotives rocking right now. Um, Rick Tomlin left a comment. Auto is rocking right now. But um, are you? <laughs> is Denko? Uh, nice job. Yeah, is Denko still Hooper Autobahn Edge? As far yeah. as yeah, okay. we uh, we distribute Hooper Optic um, Autobahn for the automotive uh, crowd. And then Edge, which which has both flat glass automotive and deco foams in it. Um, a lot of our signage customers um, buy that because they do window film as well. We're also a um, 3M uh, Fasara and glass finishes distributor as well. So there's there's four different lines of film there. Okay, and then you're mainly West Coast, but do you sell? Could you sell to anybody in the whole country, or is there certain territories that you're? Um you can sell to with Huber Autobahn and edge there's, there's territory. So, you know, pretty much from the Dakotas on down, um, uh, to New Mexico, all the way over to the West coast. That's us. We've got eight warehouses in that territory, Seattle, Portland, Bay area, Fresno, LA, Boise, Albuquerque, and Denver. Um, and then out of those warehouses, we, we run our own delivery trucks. Um, mm -hmm. They're kind of um, running on a unique cycle right now with the COVID-19 stuff. But normally, um, we do free local delivery, uh, which is nice if you need it right away. Um, usually, if it's in stock, it'll get to you the next day. Or if you order early enough, sometimes you can get it same day. Right. And that's, I mean, that's a huge difference than most difference than most other window film distribution or, or manufacturers and there's a huge value to that because I, I i don't remember a single time in the years that we were ordering from denko that um the delivery guy ever lost a package or like he skipped the delivery that or day. stepped on it <laughs> or stepped on it or any like it, it never happened like you know it was the same same guy every day um it was a box in a van. It wasn't in a truck full of, you know, tons of other boxes. And I think, I don't know, that's, um, that's another value. If you're close to one of Denko's distribution, it, it should be something that you consider when you're choosing where to buy stuff from, I think, because you want to rack up as many value, like as many um, conveniences and like values. They, they add up over time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh you guys, we, we, we tried to make a big difference in your business. I, I think, you know, people look at distribution kind of funny. I've, I've heard comments that, you know, we don't need distribution. And, um, it, you know, it's a service-based business. Um, and, and some people might think, well, they're just, they're taking a big chunk of margin. And, and we really don't. We work off of volume. And there's, there's certain uh, uh, equations to, you know, successfully distributing um, there's a lot of cost involved in carrying a product on the shelf, but um, being able to scale something and have it readily available uh, for your customer, especially when there's emergency. I, you know, I remember you guys calling us back 
you know, when you had tight schedules, certain people only had their homes open for a certain amount of time and we had to get stuff out there and, you know, the drivers get to know you and they know your business, you know, where your installers are at and, you know, we're able to adjust for that. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's value mm -hmm. there that other companies can't do. Um, do I have a, a window film machine in, in my warehouse where I can pump out my own film? No, I don't. Um, but I do have forklifts and I do have vans. And um, so there, there is some value to that. Sure. The idea behind distribution is somebody has to distribute the product, even if it was the person who makes it. But in this case, it's a company that specializes in distribution. So they're going to ideally be the most efficient and an expert at it. And then you're also taking advantage of the, you know, it's not just one product. If you, you couldn't have that sort of distribution if it was just window film or just Hooper Optic. Um, so... You know, anybody who thinks right. distribution isn't needed, it is needed. It's just a matter of what it looks like. But it's it ha yeah. have to have distribution. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and, and you can custom tailor it. I mean, if, if your business is growing and you see that, you, you know, you're going to be buying a certain type of product, whatever it may be, and a lot of it, you can have your distributor stock and carry that inventory for you. And if you're on terms with them, like I had a customer today, he needed net 45 because of the project he was working on and he qualified for it. So we were happy to give it to him and kind of help out that way. But, um, you know, you think of being able to carry inventory, there's, um, there's a little known cost, um, called the cost to carry. And it's actually, um, they've proven it's anywhere from 25 to 55% your cost to carry. And people don't always think about that. They think, well, I'll make a direct deal with whomever and bring this in and put it in my shop. If you're not turning it, it's burning a hole in your shelf. It's using capital that you could use for marketing or hiring employees. Um, it, it can be really toxic in a sense mm -hmm. where a distributor who's, who's churning those numbers, they can afford to, to carry it because they're moving it all the time. And so you can leverage those guys um, to carry that stock that you need. Right. While you grow your business. Right. Because everything has a cost, you know, opportunity cost, uh, financial cost, but like it all has a cost. It's just a matter of if you're weighing it out and, and really looking at what that cost is. And like you said, space in yeah. the shop. Like how so many. Whoever they are, try and, try yeah. and partner with them. Mm hmm. Like, you know, no find, find that local distributor and, and, and try and partner with them if they're carrying the products. And if they don't ask them if they can, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we don't carry, but if somebody asks me, we can look into it and, and see if it's possible. What, um, what are you seeing as far as like antimicrobial or any solutions related to the, the whole COVID thing other than obviously signage and, and barriers? Are you seeing other like solution services, films? Yeah. Yeah, um, so we carry um, a UVC light, and it's basically about the size of a brick with a handle on the top, and it emits UVC, which is a, a portion of the UV spectrum at 275 nanometers that our atmosphere normally um, filters. Otherwise, we'd, we'd be in big trouble. Um, but what UVC does is it hits the RNA and DNA molecules in um, bacteria and viruses, and it disassembles it. So it basically takes apart any of those things. And, and, and that's what they use to sterilize dental instruments with, uh, hospital instruments, hospital rooms. This is just a portable solution. And what we're finding is we were first only distributing it to the medical field because that's where the primary need was. And then we widened it out because now that companies are opening back up and whatever phase you may be of opening, some companies handle a lot of cash. Um, like I live in Nevada casinos. Those guys are going to have to sanitize cash, which is really weird. Um, but these are perfect for doing that. You can sanitize um, keyboards and countertop surfaces that get touched a lot with it. Um, could you do a car? You, you probably could. Um, basically it's five seconds of exposure. Um, unlike some of the chemical solutions, which are really good ones, this is a one-time purchase. Um, these machines run about 1500 to $2,500 depending on 
what you get. But you know, some of the other solutions, they're they're costing you so much a car, whether it's a dollar, ten dollars, uh, or more, and that will add up way past you know fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars. So um, that might be a really good solution to look into. Um, you, you can contact me um, or anyone at Denco um, because we've got a good partnership uh, with a company that, that manufactures that product and it, it works well. The, um, the other things are like um, antimicrobial um, coatings, um, which I made a comment somewhere and I just simply said, um, you really ought to learn about it. it it's, it's needed. Um, there are good products out there. But learn what you're selling and how it works before you go out and pitch it because it may not do what you think it does. And you really don't want to damage your good name. You, you certainly don't want to hurt anybody. Right. Um, but there are products that are um, photocatalytic. And photocatalytic is basically... Um, something that absorbs UV to create a chemical reaction or basically a hostile surface for bacteria so it can't reproduce. Mm -hmm. And it works great, but you need UV. So if you try and put it in a car that has window film on it, how much UV is going right. to get through that window film and, and make that work? So that, that would be something you definitely want to watch out how you use it. Um, there's some others. There's films that are antimicrobial. Again, just um, they usually use silver or something in them. Um, just figure out how they work, what their limitations are, um, and if there's a spot in your business for it. Um, I think that's you know just one of those opportunities that's going to be around for the future for a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's um. If you try to like plan even like six months, like try to plan like from here to six months, it's kind of tough to plan anything now, like to even think about what things are going to look like because unforeseeable. Even, it's, it feels <laughs> like, unworthy. yeah, it feels like the like the COVID thing. It almost feels like it's, um, I want to call it like fading away, like, like, oh, that's not really that big of a, like, I don't know. It's just the, the vibe I get, but it's kind of like, you know, we've, we've moved on. It's, it's, it, you still, it still has a reminder. Like you go to the supermarket or you have to wear a mask outside and so on. But for the most part, it, it almost feels like it became secondary on, on the mind with what's with the riots and the, you know, if, if you're looking at it from a business perspective, you know, your mind is insecurity now almost. And like you said, anti-graffiti almost more than, than hell. So it's almost like what, what is six months from now going to look like? You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, I, I know everybody's got kind of a different opinion on COVID. Um, I've got family that works in the medical field. Some of them are nurses and doctors. And um, so yeah, I, I personally believe it. it it's real. It, it really kills people. And it could, right. you know, at the very least put you in the hospital and you'd have a massive hospital bill and nobody wants that. But, but, you know, here's something to think about is if we don't, protect ourselves or if we get too complacent and it finds its way into our company then you, you know how good's your company when your employees are all sick and that about that right could be devastating and that was something that we were really concerned about in the outset is first and foremost we don't want anybody harmed our our, our company's like family everybody we got 150 employees everybody knows each other um we don't want to see anybody hurt but if it were to find its way in and you know, let's say take out half or more of our staff, then, you know, how good are we going to be or how viable is doing business going to be? Yeah. Yeah. And so. just from, from a liability point of view too, um, right. as a business, it's just it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's uh, on a positive side, there's a lot of things that, that we can implement and there's a lot of things that we can sell to, you know, not just protect ourselves, but help other people protect themselves. And if everybody's doing something, it's better than nothing. And and probably, hopefully, you know, we'll progress through this. Okay, a lot of things will probably be different from here on out. But I mean, we normally travel, um, and you know, for work quite a bit. And now there's there's no traveling right now, right. so we're doing more video. Um, finding ways to adjust, but, uh, yeah, it's, 
it's going to be different. It's going to be different. If businesses weren't already worried about like having been closed for months and restrictions on being open, now they are worried potentially about not having windows or doors or any products left in them. Like it's the way it's compounded is like um, is surreal. But you know, I guess life moves on and keep rolling. Um, you just you have to deal with it. I mean, if if, if any of us could foresee this coming uh, i mean i would have stocked up on mcm board <laughs> for days um and and so now what you get is a run on things just like you know early on everybody made a run on toilet paper for whatever the reason and toilet paper was really hard to get for a while um and and it's it's that way with some products uh, we're starting to see that as it, it's tough so um you know, work with your supplier. They're they're metering things out so that you always have something in stock, but um, it doesn't create this chain reaction that breaks down a supply chain. Um, it is kind of one of the challenges right now because you know there's companies out there that are big enough to buy up you know a bunch of window film or you know a bunch of any particular supply, and if everybody did that, um, it, it put the hurt on us. Um, all so um, just work work with your supplier um, and if your supplier's not working you, you know look for another one and you may have to use a few things you normally don't do use until supply chains level out because um, it's 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 affecting globally so things like um, PET for instance most of that's made outside of the country because of environmental regulations mm -hmm. so um, you know, eventually that's going to affect window film in some way, shape, or form. Um, there's other vinyl. It's kind of the same thing. So as far as like PET regulations, is that because of um, like in the process of making it, the somehow destructive to the environment or to the people making it? Or how does that, what is that? The uh... Yeah, it's environmental. It's a petroleum-based product. And so, you know, like California has so many regulations, you I think it'd probably be impossible to make it there. Um, you could, uh, I'm sure there's places that make it in small quantities, but in big, massive quantities for uh, a big window film supplier, like, you know, like take Eastman, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, they make so much window film. They need these, these huge raw material suppliers to feed that. And so you got, you've got to go overseas. Isn't that and, interesting um, that you have to pollute, that, you have to pollute another part of the world to get it done? <laughs> it's like i don't like it's just when you're saying it it's not something that i've really harped on in my like ever thought about but as you're saying you're like yeah you have to go outside the country to get it done it's like we just have to pollute over there instead of over here it sounds like there but doesn't you know it is what it is i mean for now, yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. yeah there's to... my, there's ironies all over the place i mean <laughs> you know you can cradle the grave window film and make a case that you know it's it, it's environmentally good but you got to get your PET made over in somebody else's country. Right. So I, I don't know. Uh, it's one of those things. <laughs> so ceramic coating, um, you guys carry Ceramic Pro, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So obviously everybody knows about ceramic coating for cars. I feel like we've talked in the past and, and you've spoken about some, I guess, like initiatives or testing or looking into, um, you know, more of the commercial applications, both on vinyl and on other commercial um, you know, like, like, uh, like commercial, commercial pipes and all sorts of, it. how does that look? What have you, what are your thoughts on that? Because I feel, I feel like, you know, the, the, I, I assume like you do that, you know, while automotive is the thing of right now, it'll eventually get its way to more of a grip on, on everything other than just cars. Yeah. Well, automotive was like the lowest hanging fruit for that product. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it was the, the obvious choice to go into the market with it. And, and it's done what it's done, which is great. Um, but there's all these different uses you can put it towards. They, you know, they jumped over to Marine, which it, it works there. It has its place. Um, residential. Um, I mean, all you need to do is put it on your refrigerator. If you have kids, you'll be a firm believer in a ceramic coating. Um, so it works good there. Commercial, uh, you know, I'd say with that, the hardest thing is just finding the time to install it because it's got to set up. And so, you know, like take a bar, for instance. When are you going to get a bar to shut down? 
so that your ceramic coating can, can cure. cure. So how long for, do you need to 40 cure? Hours. 48 hours? Yeah, roughly. It just depends on the coating. Um, Would it be realistic it, to bring in like UV lights for a bar and try to cure it in like five or six or ten? Oh, the infrared lights? Yeah. Or infrared, I mean, yeah. Um, it would, it would speed it up. You just got to figure out a way to do it. That's a lot of lights. Um, so not, yeah, th there's some challenges, but I mean, that's, that's business. You, you know, you see there's a challenge and if you can figure out a way around it, um, then there's a lot of opportunity to be had. Um, and, and it's kind of sitting there waiting for someone to figure it out because the products work. Um, in, you know, a distributor can only take it so far. We don't like to compete against our customers. We won't. So we don't go out into those spaces and try and sell the jobs, but we support and encourage our customers to do that um, because the opportunity is there. Uh, signage and graphics, uh, it works really well on um, channel letters in strip malls. I mean, the reds and the yellows hold up great when they're coated. And so you get... I mean, everything will break down in time. There's no, right. um, just like with window film, you can't say it doesn't prevent fading. It, it just extends the life of everything. And in graphics, what it does is it keeps everything kind of aging uniformly, where if untreated, your reds just go first and those fade out and look terrible. The yellows are not too far behind. Everything on a south west west exposure is burned out before the east side and so it just kind of levels everything out it makes it easy to clean um it's you know why have a sign if it stays dirty it sends the wrong message and so um some signs are 30 40 feet up in the air and so companies have to get a boom lift they have to pay somebody to go up there and do it if you can get a stream of water up to a coated surface with a ceramic coating, everything's going to drop off it. So um, there's good money savings there. Um, with vinyl, um, I, I think the easiest way to relate to it is there's there's a lot of people on here that'll um, put matte vinyl on a car, but they hate doing it because they know it's only a matter of time before that customer comes back with a shiny spot on it because they tried to clean something off it. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing with signage. Um, you can put it on those vinyls and now a surface becomes touchable. Let's say it's in a restaurant or a public area where people are actually touching the sign. Um, so there's all kinds of places. It's just somebody taking it now because it's available and going out and doing it. Yeah. Um, and we have some customers that, that are, um, they kind of, fly under the radar because i think they want to they want to just radar. do it not having no competition <laughs> yeah i mean you just made me visualize i'm thinking like a bakery um just like <laughs> probably because i want stuff from a bakery but you just i'm visualizing you know you said people touching stuff like like if you have a display case at your business and people are constantly touching the display case you know you, you have to constantly be cleaning that you can't have fingerprints on a display case like it looks terrible even if it's a jewelry store or whatnot it just looks terrible right i'm wondering is it reasonable or would it be feasible do you think if if somebody's in a house on a consultation to say hey let me show you what this can do on a refrigerator or on a dishwasher real quick and is that like application process like hey i can go grab that i can apply it really quick not a big deal let it cure and we're good or not so much if you could get them to just keep their hands off it for, you know, 24 hours, um, they'll see the result. I used to do that with window film. Um, back in the day when I was selling it as a dealer, um, I do a try before you buy. And so, um, you know, if it was like nine square feet or less, and that was usually the kitchen window over the kitchen sink, I do one pane for a customer. I just bring my tools and um, you know, put up ceramic 30, ceramic 40, usually look good, add a good result to it. And so you did half that window and the other half was clear glass. And, um, you know, the homeowner, whether it was the husband and wife would get in front of there to do the dishes or something when the sun's coming through and they could feel it. And so, um, it's the same thing with ceramic coatings is just do one side of the refrigerator and, um, they'll call you back, uh, especially if they have kids. Cause, um, they're, 
you just get stuff on a refrigerator door. You don't even know what it is. It's it's nasty. Um, but the coated side's great. <laughs> so, hilarious. I don't have kids, but that's um, my, I that's can't my wait. sales beta. <laughs> well, dogs too. Although your dog can't get up that high on the no, fridge. No, no. Um, yeah, but I'll I'll look lower. There's probably something there from her. <laughs> yeah, I know on the inside of my car there is. <clears throat> <laughs> so. Um, Rick Tallman asked if you could explain the difference between Hooper, Autobahn, and Edge. Um, yeah, there are three different brands, Hooper, Autobahn, and Edge. Um, uh, Hooper Optic um, was arguably the first uh, marketed nano ceramic window film to market back in around 2000. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to get into – you know, we're great on flat glass. It looked amazing, sold, sold like crazy. Um, there was a handful of people that said, wow, if you could put this on a car, it would be incredible. And um, it has its challenges, but there were guys that, that rose to the challenge, made a bunch of money doing it, right. um, and a lot of happy customers. I, I had it on my cars, and, uh, and I've always liked it. Um, but, you know as time moves on and you know shops get bigger and they want to process more cars and they want to sell a good ceramic um that was a need um they wanted their own territory kind of like a formula one was the only thing going on back then um and just some you know real special things for point of sale uh like good sales tools like a good looking solid heat demo and kind of a way to educate the customers um, we came up, uh, actually right here in Reno with the whole Autobahn program and, and uh, it, it kind of gave birth here, um, out of a little office in the former distributor here. And, um, it's, it's grown into a nice competitive program. It's got really solid films in it. Um, you know, if there's, if you can't get something like formula one in the area, um, Autobahn's another territory opportunity where you could have an exclusive territory um so it differs from huper in that respect it's only automotive film mm -hmm. um edge was like born out of um a little frustration um so huper had all these great high-end films in it we had some traditional films but um there were customers that were still going and you know buying sun tech or whatever um, for price point reasons. And so we thought, you know, gosh, if we could come out with just a, a solid film line, but take all the bells and whistles out of it and bring the price way down so that, um, you know, if you've got a real competitive commercial market that you're trying to operate in, or maybe you're new to the business and you can't afford a thousand, two thousand dollar roll of film, um, nor do you want to mess one up. Um, yeah, Edge, Edge kind of came from those needs. And so each brand serves a different need. It's kind of like having a toolbox full of different tools. We don't use the same squeegee all the time when we tint. We've got something purposeful for each situation. And that's kind of what they're all about. Yeah. Hope and, that answers your question, Rick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can say, like, it, you explained it perffectly uh, Hooper Optic. You know, I think thought of more for flat glass. Marine has an incredibly great reputation um, on the consumer level. Like if you search the brand, you're going to find really positive stuff, which I think is really, really important when it comes to selling a product is when, you know, people are searching and what are they finding? And with Hooper, one of the things was you, you found you can find it for years back and it's always exceptional, like exceptional stuff. It's from happy people. And you know, like you said, Autobahn is automotive. Hooper, I think, is more flat glass. But, you know, there's still people out there who will contact, like, look for specific Hooper ceramic or Hooper Dre or Hooper sec. And they want it on their oh, car. Yeah. And they're willing to pay anything to get it done. And it's just... Yeah, and you, can't, you can't change their mind. They'll, uh, they'll drive <laughs> to the ends of the earth to go find that dealer that can that can do a nice job at it and mm -hmm. and I always thought you know that's whatever the brand or you know you get a situation like that and you know maybe it's a small part of your business but right. it's a part of your business that you can get really good at right and it's almost enjoyable 
Um, because you're making somebody happy, they're getting what they want, and you're really good at installing it. And and so, you know, who cares if it's really hard? It's just it adds to your reputation. And so the rest of your business that you're doing, it's I don't know. It yeah. I, I just see that referral type of business yep. off a of reputation. That's just like marketing that you can't buy. Yep. If you wanna if you wanna charge a customer over a thousand dollars for window film, that's the brand that comes to mind. If I'm on if I'm on the apprentice and I have to do it and I have twenty four hours, that's gonna be the brand I go with to try to get the job done because I feel like those people that are, are looking for Dre, a thousand plus is not is not a wrong price or a crazy price. Whereas with other films, you're going to have somewhat of a ceiling as far as price goes because it's a lot of options. Yeah. You know. Yeah, uh, and uh, I don't know. It, you know, we you think about things like the the tint off, and they ought to have a category of um, hard products to work with. Most um, difficult, you know, yes, for to do. Yeah, I, um, I, you know, I definitely on the flat glass side, you know, throwing some French paints with uh, some old painted wood um, or putty windows. I know that would be. <laughs> and then, fun. then we'll find out who the world's best, you know, is. Um, I don't know. I just think little quirky things like that. But uh, yeah, to your point. It's um, it's great film. It's fun to sell. Um, it looks great um, when it's up against anything else. I, you know, always that's my pretty much my sales presentation as I challenge somebody. Tell me which film's the best, and you put anything up against Super, and most of the time they choose it. Um, it, it just looks great because it's it's made very well. Um, yeah, makes it fun. And whether you're putting a pooper or not, I think the key too is like you said. When you did sales, you always put something up. You're putting something up on the glass. Like if you're not putting something up on the oh, glass, yeah. you're really like cutting your neck off. Like you might make some sales, but you want to make more sales and you want to make the most, you know, like put the film up on the glass, have a heat demo, have samples, like yeah, the whole thing. I mean, if you're going to if you're going to paint your house, you don't go down to Home Depot and pick your color off the the little chip card there at Home Depot. I mean, some people might, but <laughs> I don't think you're going to get the result that you think you're going to get. Yeah. Um, but, you you know, you get a little can of it. You go home and you put some samples on the wall, um, you know, especially if you're married and, it, you know, your life depends on what your wife thinks um, of it. Um, you, you know, you pick that out based on the sample because that's where it's yeah. going to live. Yeah. And, and I, I just don't see anything different with window foam. We used to, when I started, we just like, cut pieces off the roll and grease pen on what it was and set it on the table. And when it's down on the table, everything looks the same. Um, yeah. But you get it up on the window, you do a nice sample, yeah. um, you give them some education. Let's go look at it on the outside so you understand what it looks like. Yeah. Um, you might even want to let it sit there through the evening and see what it looks like at night when the lights are on. And uh, then there's no surprises to the customer and, you know, Usually, ten times out of ten, they're going to make the right decision, yeah. and that adds to your reputation. Right, right, and you can't expect the customer to figure out what they're looking at on their own because you know, like you said, it, it you may think it's going to look like they all look the same on the counter, but like the color of the sky that they're going to look at every day, the color of their plants, how their pool looks, everything on the outside of the window actually looks a little more green or a little more blue or a little more yellow or whatever it is. And if you point that out to them, I feel like that's how you kind of get in the customer's head to where they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. And now yeah. they know what they want as opposed to you didn't point that out and they never really considered it. Because I know like sometimes you just I know for myself, like you don't see things until you see them for a while. Sometimes you just you don't you don't notice. Um, right. It, when somebody points it out to you or it kind of you see for a while, you you realize the differences. Oh yeah, I mean one of the I, I one of my biggest mistakes I made selling flat glass years ago. I sold this bronze job, and it was bronze. I think it was a thirty five percent. I don't want to mention the brand because it, it's a good brand, but um, it it was it was some strange bronze. It was very rosy looking, almost like a red. And and bronze is made from copper, and so you got to put a color layer in there to kind of tone down the rosiness of the copper. But this didn't have it, and these people picked it, and I sold it to them, and installed it, and 
you could just feel the tension um, <laughs> after yeah. it was all up. It was like, this is not what we... It was like they went to Home Depot and picked the color right off the card chip in Home Depot. You, you know, oh, no. it was, I, I, I felt bad because um, at that point in my career, I should have been a better salesperson and like got a sample up and told them, you know, you really ought to live with this for a little while and take a look at it. And it was kind of my growth process, as you would say, um, in sales. And I'm curious on copper, like on copper films, like they've always, for some reason, they've been something that I liked and barely, like barely, barely, barely ever sold. I think if we were matching something or somebody was specific and asked for copper, other than that, it never sold. But am I right in saying it's just like, it's something that's maybe popular in certain regions based on landscape color and so on? Like, is it, I always just think of like Arizona and Utah, if I think of copper film. Oh yeah. I mean, I live near Lake Tahoe. I tended up in Tahoe. That's where I where I learned and they have all of those um, stained houses up there. And we sold miles of bronze film. Um, and it, that didn't change until the ceramics hit the market back in 2000 because they, they have kind of that earth tone look, but they're less reflective. They don't have the dye in it and um, they're sputtered. So they just, they just look better. And so it mm -hmm. cannibalized all the bronze to where it, it just dried up. We stopped selling it. Um, and even now as a distributor, I notice you know, bronze sales aren't what ceramic sales are at, at all. But bronze is, it's an awesome film. It's, um, it's very low absorbing and it's very high performing. And so, you know, if you have a customer that needs that performance, they aren't particular about the reflectivity, color doesn't matter as much. But, you know, maybe it's a dicey glass situation where, you really don't want to use a neutral product. Um, bronze is still a great fit. We did we did a project down in Phoenix, um, like fifty thousand square feet or something like that. Um, the customer is totally happy. The energy audit came out amazing. A lot of kilowatt hour reductions. Film was reasonably priced, so their ROI is going to be really quick. Two years, something like that. So um, it's like a different. So it's, it's like an alternative to silver. Right, like a silver film, yeah. that are kind of just alternative silver. Is it something that you think like people buy um, in instances based on the view out or the color from the outside as well? Are those like uh, factors you think that go into a lot of bronze sales? Like, is that a thing? Like, because I think you it, have the desert, you want the bronze film to look out at. I think it's more of whatever the salesperson shows them. If they pull it out then you know they they just might sell it if they don't and they pull out a ceramic it's going to be a ceramic sales but but it's rare that people pull out both and 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 give them the option and um you know to my point about my bronze faux pas um you know as a salesperson you got to be able to read your customer i, I it's kind of like going to a shoe store when you leave the shoe store with a pair of shoes they better fit just as you'd hoped and as, as yeah. you'd expected. And we got to, you know, meet that customer expectation if it's reasonable and it can be met, then it's up to us to take what we have and make the best recommendations. Um, I remember years ago, I, I went to um, this place in town where there's a lot of mobile homes and they wanted their mobile home tinted. And so I, I kind of profiled them, which I shouldn't have done. That was another mistake. <laughs> Um, you know, so I pulled out the silver films and, you know, cheaper dual reflectives and somehow, um, a Dre spec card fell out of my thing. And the guy looked at it. He was like, what's this? And, you know, He's like, oh, you don't want I that. I told him what it was and yeah, you won't be interested in that. And, you know, I'm writing up the bid and everything. He's like, could you put a price on this one? I really like the way it looks and all right, you want it, you got it. And, you know, it was a pretty big number and he was like, let's do it. Yeah. Double wide motorhome, Dre. So uh, I mean, this is another learning lesson uh, for me. Is you, you don't, you always want to offer like three choices. Um, we short circuit if we get four. We go to Google, and that's a not a good place to go if you're trying to close the sale. But give them a low, medium, and high. Put the samples up. Explain, you know, what is what and why it's priced the way it is. Let them see it from the outside, the inside. And, you know, if you really, 
if I feel comfortable with a company, I'm probably going to buy something from them and I'm going to be less likely to, you know, look somewhere else for a cheaper price. Right. And so you just got to kind of hit that comfort level that give them that knowledge they need without overwhelming them and then just let them look at it. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not a hard product to sell. It's such a great product. It does a lot of great things and yeah. Whether it's your cheapest film or your most expensive, they still filter UV, infrared, and visible light. They they all do the same thing. So yeah, and yeah, I think like um, like I know like when I'm looking for a service, I, just myself personally, my mind primarily goes on I want the job done right, and I think like if you can communicate that you're a company that's going to get the job done right, regardless of which film they choose. Uh, I think that's that's a winning winning angle yeah. because if you go into it thinking that everybody's concerned about price, you're going to probably miss the boat and and you know head down that price road and and all sorts of. Well, I really I appreciated the way you guys did business back in the past. Is it, you know you were using your software, which is now Tintwiz, and uh, you had that feature in it where you were taking jobs that you did in the area and you could reference them based on film type, which was really cool. And so now you give people, well, here's what it looks like on this home. And here's, you know, here's some, and, you know, kind of, it's, it's such a weird thing. We don't buy window film all the time. So right. it's one of those quirky purchases that, that some people just need that assurance. Yeah. And you had, you had a great system for it. Yeah. Well, it was taught to me early on that like people, with window film, maybe with everything, but people like a lot of people, whether they know it or not, they're kind of looking for somebody who's done what they're looking for. Like, so knowing that you've done more work in a neighborhood that's theirs, or you've done houses like theirs, or you've done Prius primes, like even with cars, even with normal cars, like being able to show that, yeah, you know, here's, here's 10 pictures of a CA Corvette that we've done. Like that goes a long way to people. Like it's, it, again it shifts from being about price and it brings up an opportunity that you know um yeah and i mean automotive is is well yeah you just catalog all of that and i'm sure tint Wiz does that as well yep and and that's one of the places where like i, I see it i see it all the time because there's posts about um people will be like you know, hey, what's a good scheduling software? And somebody would be like Google Calendar and then you'd be like Apple Calendar and then there is this one and that one. And like there are so many great scheduling systems out there where you can schedule people. There's great reminder systems. There's really great systems for everything. But the question is, do they come together to do everything you need? And that's one of the things like, yeah, you can schedule your jobs using Google Calendar, iCalendar. You don't need anything fancy and it can be free. Right. But what do you do with those pictures? And then are the pictures manageable when you're doing a few jobs a week? But how does that look three years into it? You know, and like, yeah, those are the well, kind of things. And that... Being able to access it from a mobile device. I mean, <laughs> right. way back when we were all just on our computers and we're, you know, going into the auto folder and the make and the model and then emailing it out. And now it's like you need to find it on your phone because you're standing in front of somebody mm -hmm. and you airdrop it to them or, or whatever. And, um, yeah, you gotta do it like a sign whiz sign whiz. So, <laughs> so the idea <laughs> is that tint whiz, you know, what we're doing is First of all, you can quote signs within TintWiz now, but we are working on building out all the complementary services that a tint company could possibly um, also be carrying, whether it be flat glass or automotive. So it can be kind of all inclusive within TintWiz and still be open to add products that we didn't even think about that you're maybe selling in addition to. But the you know that's that's the idea is really we're um, we have so many plans to dig deeper into the tint industry that it really takes away the desire to say like, Hey, we're going to get into this industry or that industry. Um, but definitely sign being complimentary. You know, you want to be able to quote them together. No question about it. You got, um, do you have perf in there? So we don't, okay. So currently we have preloaded, I think all the window films, we don't have preloaded like all the signs, all the ceramic coatings, all the PPFs. 
So what I mean by preloaded, we don't have all like the brands preloaded. We don't have like like right. the packages preloaded and, and that sort of thing. But you can just put anything you want. So you could just type in window perf or, you know, any sort of signage channel lettering and just quote it. You're just typing it instead of it being preloaded. But having it, you know, just be a couple of clicks and, and kind of guiding you along the way and having those products in there is definitely part of the plan. Yeah, I mean, we do, um, the, the window tinners are using a lot of clear perf for turf guard. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's a product out there called turf guard, which is basically clear perf being sold at a really nice price. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you guys making a ton of money off of it, but, but it's perf. I mean, that, that's what we supply. We have supplied it forever and you, you know, you dry install it on the exterior of a window and it's um there's some other ways to bring down reflectivity you can do anti-reflective films and bring a window down to five percent or even two and a half percent reflectivity but but that's an expensive way to go and sometimes you have to do both sides mm -hmm. to get the result so what um, kind of film would do that if you were trying to bring down the reflectivity even if you had to do both sides like what kind of opportunity same stuff they use on flat screens so would that be okay so would that be like an option Cause like we, you know, we used to have a lot of like storefronts calling and, you know, storefronts, they want their product to be seen. And if unfortunately the glass that was put in there has some reflection to it, they're saying, Hey, how do I get rid of this reflection on my storefront? So people can see my products. What are some solutions out there for that? Yeah. Um, Lin, Lin Tech, um, has a film that, uh, is anti-reflective, um, uh, I think there's a there's another one. I just don't know what the brand is, um, but but they're all the same thing. They use the biggest space. I think they use them in is flat screen televisions to get the reflectivity off of that glass, and it's the same principle as you're just putting it on a window to knock it down. Um, you know, if you do one side on regular clear glass, it's roughly nine ten percent reflective. You could bring it down to about five. Um, if you do both sides, um, you can bring it down to about two and a half, but, um, and it, do, it's, it's expensive. <laughs> and like when I'm thinking about a TV right now, I'm kind of thinking of like this matte kind of like grainy finish on the cover. Like, is that what, what it looks like? Like it does, it does have a matte sort of surface to it. If you look at it really close, cause that's, what's dispersing the light and the reflectivity. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's that bad. If it's, it's like a Gucci store, do you think they're going for it? What's that? If it's like the Gucci store on Rodeo, do you think they're going for it? Well, if the reflectivity is too, you know, bad enough to where they can't see the Gucci purse, then, uh, you know, got to sell. They'll... <laughs> well, I mean, it, I guess it, Gucci's it's not that bad. changing the glass. But like what I'm saying is like, do you think, would it be unsightly in any way to have a storefront that had it applied does it is it like what's on that no. glass or is it like barely noticeable it's just a window film person would know no it's i think a window tinner would pick it out and go wow they put some kind of coated coating on here or film um but most people wouldn't notice hmm. that's I, I feel like yeah, that probably. right there for storefronts such a market um just because storefronts yeah. like people move into a store they're typically renting they didn't pick the glass. It was there. It's not necessarily what they want. And they're probably going to be there maybe three to five years. They're not thinking about, hey, I'm moving into a store. Let's replace all the glass. They usually find out right after right. they're already in. They're like, wait, what's this? How come you can't see it? Yeah. You know? Well, it's, well, it's, um, it's, it's exterior. So, yeah, three to five years is probably right what you mind. get out of it, too. Yeah, you got to keep that, that in mind, um, exposure and everything. But, yeah, I mean, there's the, – there's, those types of products to put in the tent was, I was just thinking about it, you know, before I came on and talked to you and it's like, you know, what are some of the things I could ask you is, have you ever thought of putting, um, glass breakage guidelines, uh, glass breakage guidelines, like for each type of film? Um, yeah, like, you know, man, manufacturers all, all have their mm -hmm. recommended, you know, film to glass recommendations on there. Um, so uh, it's 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 a big consideration in in the business. Yeah. So it's, I, I there's a huge opportunity there, and it's definitely something that we're like actively working on, and it's part of that film library that we're building. And you know, there's a, the reason we preloaded the films in there is because 
actually know from experience when we were using the software, before the software was launched to the public, one of the things that we ran into was we didn't have all the films preloaded in there. So they would get kind of added as you would go. And you think like any yeah. system you set up, that's what you're going to do. You're kind of add them as you go. Well, when you add them as you go, what you tend to do is you might not be as uniform as you may want to be with the films causing some confusion. And then inevitably you end up with duplicates in there and then duplicates become crazy confusing, confusing to you now because you've just split your pr one product right. into two places. So, you know, we, that's why we've preloaded the films in there. Now from there, the next thing we did was, you know, most of the films have a description attached to them. So if you, if you go in there, you're quoting Hooper ceramic 40, um, in the notes section is going to pop up a description and some key points to Hooper ceramic 40. Um, and the reason being is because that was also something that I felt like gave us a competitive advantage was just simply the way we kind of communicated the films we were proposing to the customer that they could read it and kind of get an understanding of what that film is. Because, you know, something like Hooper Ceramic 40, if you explain that it has a natural view from the inside out, a natural kind of view from the outside looking in, and there's, you know, low re reflectivity and so on. If you explain that to somebody, they can start to visualize it. They can understand what they're getting. If you write C40, you're writing hieroglyphics to the person. So anyway, yeah. we've preloaded descriptions in there. Now, from there, like you just said, glass breakage, um, the actual specs on the film, what the specs mean. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can list the specs to a film, but if you don't explain what those specs are, like you value, I still can't explain you value, um, you can <laughs> But like, if you tell me the U value is of a film, I don't even know if the number should be higher or lower. I, I don't, you know what I mean? So the same happens to when you explain it to a customer. So to your, to your question, as far as like glass breakage standards and so on, that is, those are all like, you know, we envision a library to where when you're quoting that film or even as a tin shop and you're working with intent was you're able to figure out solutions and be able to communicate it and transfer that information all digitally, all in one place without attachments, emails, printouts, this and that. But what I find, I found kind of like interesting is how disorganized, now I'm going to talk, talk a little bit of shit, but just in general, when you look at all the window <laughs> manufacturers, how disorganized, like when you go to look for this stuff, you'll find versions from five years ago, 10 years ago, you'll find film lists that have some films, but some of them don't carry anymore and some are not on there. And like, you'll find w their website will call a film something different than their PDF that's still both are like new, like newish. And like, they're so, it's kind of everywhere to where I definitely agree those like guidelines and so on, everything does, does need to be put in one place. And as of right now, it doesn't really exist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some, some companies have little internal things that they update and they get out to their networks, but yeah, I can, you know, the internet, once it hits the internet, it can sit out there, till it's dead and gone and still be out there and access and, you know, have wrong information. I, I, there's just a part of me that I, you know, I have brands that I sell and of course, you know, I compete and that's my stuff I sell. And then there's this other part of me that just, you know, for the industry, if we all collectively do things right, it really adds to the betterment for everybody. Yeah. Um, and, and that's better than the opposite. To yeah. me, you know, like if I see a big old uh, that there's a building down in Southern California um, <laughs> years ago, somebody got the job, somebody put a bunch of auto film on there, it, it turned purple, and um, the engineer in that building um, just hated window film from that point forward. He wouldn't even sure get the building redone when it was sure. offered because um, he just had such a sour taste and. And I, that had an impression on me. It, it's just like, you know, whenever I see or hear something that's not quite accurate, I tend to speak out and sometimes that gets me in trouble. But, um, I, yeah, it's happened. Um, <laughs> on but, Facebook. You, you know, you yeah. just think it, you think of things that, um, you could add onto tools like tint whiz or whatever that, that could help people. Like I, I remember doing a, going out to look at a building one time and it had all of this um, silver 20 on it, which low absorbing film, but the glass was breaking everywhere. And um, it was really weird. It was clear glass. It wasn't super big. And, you know, you had to kind of do CSI on it and start looking for, well, what's causing this to happen? Are there pillars putting shade on it? Are there 
Um, you know, stress cracks on the ground indicating settling. Um, are there vents, you know, pointing on just the top half of the window? Mm -hmm. And all these things that, you know, if that salesperson knew about it in the sales process, they might have pointed it out and said, hey, you want to fix this first. Change this, adjust that. I or you know, I can't sell this. Just sometimes we have to walk away. Yeah, 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 definitely. And like, even just like, just being able to go somewhere and say, "Hey, what kind of like?" I know I it would something. It would be something I'd probably I would ask you. But like, hey, what kind of films have low absorption for skylights, or what kind of film can be put on you know triple pane glass? And what like all these questions? Like these are experience questions, and like they're questions that I feel like get like knowledge that for the most part gets passed down. Like you know, we're what's person to person sometimes on Facebook, but. I think more often than not, not on Facebook. And I find that like, again, I, I, it's an opportunity that manufacturers don't really control this yet. And, and I don't mean control in like a, like a handcuffed way. What I mean control is like, hey, this is like, you don't, I don't think any manufacturers really thoroughly train somebody for flat glass on how to go in and sell it. all those different scenarios. That doesn't exist. And I, I think that's opportunity. And, for us, the way we can be opportunistic with it in TintWiz is making that part of what TintWiz is, is a resource for that knowledge. But I also think for manufacturers, it's an opportunity to um, provide more and more guidance onto the scenarios and creating that information so that it's not something that's passed down and those that are willing to take that guidance can take it, implement it, and that essentially elevates you know, I feel like even just how that brand looks to consumers, because you start to get more of a uniform message, you start to get more educated um, dealers out there and so on, you know? Yeah, I mean, for sure. It, um, I, it, it's a challenge, I, I, you know, to complement social media. Um, there's groups out there, there's a ton of automotive information. I mean, it's, it's crazy how much is available. Some of it's not right. But, you know, for the most part, there's a lot of really good information out there. And you know, there, there's just a fraction of it in flat glass. And, and for me, I, I like to help people, but there's a challenge in social media. Maybe it's just me. I just type too much or something. But it's, it's hard to explain these things and not, like, have all this other stuff come in. And sometimes it'll blow up and, it, it, you know, and you just can't get something important across to somebody that needs it. Or could use it in the future to avoid something that gives the whole industry a black eye, right? Uh, you know, so I little things like that are just ideas that come into my head that would man, it'd be really beneficial. Um, but it it would be a lot of work. So, got a couple comments: one from Rick Tom and one from Mark Carlson, both on the same subject, telling me that I'm wrong. Um, Rick says, actually, yes, they do train. I can't see the call. They do train selling flat glass. Hooper is extremely good with sales training. And then Mark said, sorry, Eric, but some manufacturers do train their salespeople and dealers how to evaluate flat glass properly. And your guest today is evidence of that. You know, I'm not saying that Hooper and Denco, I'm not saying that those resources aren't available. I believe they are available, but I just, I feel like they're more on like a ask and then you're given that information. Um, the resources are there if you want them, but I don't think necessarily as you become a Hooper dealer or an Expel dealer or whatever brand that you have to kind of go through a training that sets guidelines on how you present those films. I just feel like there's not, there's no like, here's the standard of operations you have to follow as this dealer. Here's what we recommend. Not to say if you ask for training, you're not going to get, you know, David Kratz or you or somebody who's going to be more than knowledgeable and helpful. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's there. There is training out there, but it's it's kind of like a glass. You know, you can only fill this up so much before it overflows. And so, I I I see it more as it is an ongoing relationship with your supplier. And so it's you know incumbent on the supplier to hire competent staff um, that are experienced, and it's. Um, incumbent upon that rep to, you know, work with their customers. And if their customers need, you know, some advice or some experience, it, it just comes through that channel. Could there be a class and do 
um, suppliers mm -hmm. offer information. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember um, buying from CP Films back in the day, and they had an awesome tech service uh, group there that helped out a lot. Um, I learned a lot from them back in the day. So I think like really Even, to try and like put that, uh, put it into perspective of, of like what I'm really getting at is I think for manufacturers and I think for tin shops, I think for everybody, you have to really think is all the knowledge and information that I want to relay to my customer, whether the customer is a tin shop or whether the customer is a end consumer, a home homeowner, a business owner, is all that information that we possess that we think valuable, is that available in some sort of, is it available on the website? Is it available in print form? Is it available to be easily understood? Is it organized? Is it searchable and so on? And I feel like, you know, you, it's never going to be 100%, but I do think that's something that could be extremely valuable to evaluate because I think we all know, like we're talking about Hooper Optic. We could talk, I'm sure between like Mark and, and you, how, how many ways Hooper Optic's a great film, but then the question is, all those things you're going to say, can I find that on their website? Or are these all going to okay, – all those things you're going to say, can I find it on a, a pamphlet that is handed to the customer? And we're – I'm not really speaking specific to Hooper. I'm just saying in general, I think even just as a window film dealer, you know, websites don't necessarily relay all the, all the reasons why you're the company, all the services you provide and so on. I think it's an ongoing challenge and so always moving. And I just think that focusing on getting that information out there is what matters because I think we're in an age, I know we're in an age where people are doing their own research and they are going to be coming to the computer and searching for it. And if it's in a video or if it's typed out, it exists. If it's in somebody's head, it exists less. It's like less real. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a good point. I'd, I'd say that a lot of that information is out there, but it's behind closed doors. So most suppliers have their their private networks for their customers and and you know that information's available including Huper and Vista and uh, you know sure. j just about all of them have it and so you've got that information in its place and you may or may not have access to it um, and then you know the rest of it is you know the social media channels um, you know just about everybody has access to that in the industry and so um, you know, if the platform is made and, and can facilitate and and we can be patient with each other and allow everyone to speak without it flaming up into anything, there's a lot to learn from other people. I know I still, I learn a ton going on there. Sometimes I don't say anything. I just peruse through and grab little things here and there and it, it, it's great. Um, I just I just think that um, auto is is got a tremendous amount of information out there and in comparison flat glass is just it, it it's so minute um which you know maybe it'll change yeah yeah i, I it, look information is getting more and more organized i'm just saying i think like it's like i'll read a couple more comments and then we'll uh wrap this thing up, but Rick said, here's the deal. Hooper has a full-fledged sales team and are on the cutting edge in that department. I would say you are correct on other brands. However, I'm not so sure. There are still some secrets in the industry. You have to join the team and put skin in the game to access those things. So, I mean, Rick, like I, I did put skin in the game and I, I was part of the team. So like I, I feel I'm speaking from experience and I'm not saying that no information exists. I'm not saying I'm not speaking specific to Hooper. I'm not saying that every manufacturer doesn't have its dealer resources, its dealer groups and its dealer, you know, website and so on. They, they all do. What I'm saying is I think it could be better. I think that there's room for evolution. I think with how much, you know, how much could be put on a website, how much. Look, can you can you tell me right now? Can, how quickly can anybody pull up? Show me. 10 commercial buildings that have been done with a Hooper ceramic. How quickly can we find that information? Just saying. Like, how quickly can we sort through every window film that can be on flat glass and show me the top five that have the lowest re reflectivity? Or what dual reflective, let's, let's look at a list of all dual reflectives in a 10% shade for flat glass. Those are things that like, yeah, we can find it, but like there's no list. And I'm not saying that that's like, the Ten Commandments we're waiting on, but what I'm saying is I think it's opportunity because I think the more clear we're able to relay information as an industry, whether it be from manufacturer to dealer or manufacturer and consumer or dealer to end consumer, I just think that it gets better for everybody.
Um, yeah, that's all. Well, I, I, I get I get what he's what he's alluding to. Um, I mean, I I'd, I'd like to touch on the secrets of the industry. I mean, uh, that I <laughs> I, I guess um, not everybody is obligated to come out and say everything about their business just as you know you're not obligated to tell me what's in your checking account i mean there's just some things that that are yours and some things that are mine and some things that are theirs and that's the way it is um but you know the industry is pretty easy to read is is there's manufacturers they have machines and they make stuff with those machines Mm -hmm. there's people um in the middle that either have a brand but no machines so they're a brand owner and essentially like a distributor. And then there are people that pick these brands um, up and, and, and scale them like us and make them more convenient for everybody to get. Um, and we enhance their business by bringing in a whole collection of things. Um, you know, do, do some of those films all get made in the same place but put in different boxes with different labels? Of course they do. Um, yeah, vinyl's and- that way. And I'm the least concerned about who makes the film. I think that's, yeah. to me, it's like literally the lowest thing on the list in consideration of a film is who makes it or where is it made. I can to me, it. it's what you, what can you do with it? Right. It, you know, what, what can you do with it with your business and, and how does that affect your customer? And is it, is it a beneficial effect and, and is it a growing effect? Um, yeah, it was funny. I, I, you know, I came into the signage and graphics industry when I started working for Denko about five years ago, only to learn that vinyl is very similar to window film. There's only so many machines out there. They're all made, make everything in the same place pretty much. And it, you know, it goes out to different brand owners and, um, it, you know, there you have it. So, um, it's, products it's, in it's general. just parsing through all Products in general, they're made by people who make those products. It's not like every product in general is like yeah. being handcrafted by the company who's selling it or the brand that's on it. That's, that's you know. Yeah, I, I it's I mean you've you've got a lot of companies out there that are trying to get, do good business with the product, and to me it's it's relationship, it's trust, um, you know it, it it's the benefit of of the sum of the whole. Um, and then there are companies out there that, you know, they don't always work truthfully or, or whatever. And, you know, maybe you want to avoid that or maybe maybe it works for you. Um, you know, just just pick one. I I like to align myself with the distributor that, uh, that there's good people that work here. I, I That's why I enjoy working with them. They've got really good values. They're they're honest. They try and always do the right thing. And at the end of the day. Um, whether business is good or bad, the people I work with are great. Yeah. And, 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 and I enjoy that. One of the things that I, I always try to point out, cause you know, we talk about a lot of different brands on here and people come on representing different brands and so on. And what I really try to point out, um, is, you know, just different areas of value that companies provide. There's so many different ways that companies can provide value. Like we were talking about locations, like how many distribution locations Denko has and, and the, you know, you're almost 30 years in window film no, um, knowledge. We've talked about expels like exceptional marketing and like brand appeal or ceramic pro. Like there's, there's so many ways, like there's so many different things that people are attracted to. It's really what's, what find what you find is the best fit for you where, where that value offering is, is one that matches what you're looking for, what you hold valuable. And I think the same goes for your customers too. So they're going to find value in different things. So it's about knowing who you are, knowing who your company is and what your company is about and finding companies that align with what you're looking for. It's yeah, definitely not about 10 cents I mean, per square foot or if it's made in one state or another country or whatever it is, in my opinion. No, not not really. I mean, there may be some instances where every dime counts, but, you know, overall, if you're, if you're going to start a company and you're going to have it for 10, 20, 30 years and you're going to turn around and sell it someday, there's more to it than 10 cents a square foot. Right. And in the way that you do business, I mean, we just had, you know, probably one of the biggest world crisis in the history of mankind hit the entire globe. And, and it's like, you know, what companies are out there trying to help you? I, I mean, you guys, 
you guys made a concession, didn't you, with your subscription price to help people out? Yeah, we did like three months or a little over three months with no no uh, yeah charge. I mean, how could you not? I mean, that's you have like look. We have to provide value for you have to provide value for your customers. You have to provide value for for people, and like you try to find that in every way possible. And if that's something that we can do and provide value in that time. I'm going to do it, you know, and what it led to yeah. was more people taking advantage and trying to, you know, use the software and, and integrating it in. It works for everybody. It also hopefully led right. to some people that weren't as stressed about money. So like works for everybody. Yeah. Well, and, th and that's good that you can do that because when you get on the retail end, it's harder to make a concession. I remember seeing some posts where people were walking in and just being totally unreasonable. They knew it was a crisis. They knew business was kind of at a standstill and so they wanted you know their car done for half price or you know just something totally unreasonable and and on the retail side you can't afford to to always make those concessions but if a supplier can help out in some way shape or form that's all you know part of that whole relationship thing and that goes that transcends brand whatever or you know whether this is white boxed or I don't like to say white box because it's the lid that changes. You need to say it's it's relitted or re. Relitted. You got to work on that word because it's not the box. The bottom part's always the same. I guess like it just stems from like white label. Is that the like That's white label kind of a term? So they <laughs> change the label for the box. White box. I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'm going to try and change it. I'll get in trouble for doing it but i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna read mark's comment because it's um pro eric and then we'll end this um mark, oh, mark said you're being good. too humble when you say how could you not offer free service almost nobody thinks like that we should pay attention to offers pay attention to offers to be helpful and thankful thank you um you know i i thank you mark for saying that um but you know i i just i really feel like you've got to you've got to live your life treating people like you want to be treated and, you know, I don't know, it's not about a month. It's not like you should be doing what you should do. You should always be going out of the way to make your customer happy, whoever that is, or your neighbor happy or your coworker happy or whatever it is. Like you should always. And when you're when you're always kind of looking for that little exceptional way, like you start to make people around you happy, like things things get easier for you. So like, I think kind of like the less in the way that this works for people watching, like you, you look at your customers like that, whether you're tinting their car, you're tinting their home or whatever, look at ways that you can make them a little bit happier where you look at, look at how you can say yes to them or how you can exceed their expectations, expectations in whatever way you can do that. And like life gets easier. Yeah. No, that was that was a nice compliment, and I, it was well deserved. You, you guys are doing a good job, um, and, and and you're helping out. Um, yeah, it's really well deserved. Well, thank you, and thank you for doing this today. I really, really, yeah. really appreciate. Yeah, my you dog's taking the starting time. to blow up now, so. <laughs> yeah, he probably wants to go hunt bears. Uh, he, well, we're we're gonna go mountain biking, and he knows that he's on a. He's on a time schedule and everything, so he's he's looking forward to getting out. But um, thanks for having me. I, I I I miss you know we don't travel as much, so I don't get to see you. Tell Betsy hi. Um, yeah, I just miss crossing paths. Ditto, and I hope maybe like I don't know if SEMA still a go this year, but if it's not SEMA, it's probably going to be all the way in January at the Window Something. Convention. Something. Well, we'll see what it is. But yeah, hey, take care. Keep up the good work. Um, thanks for having me and enjoy the comments on here and just fun experience. Love talking window film. Thank you. Same. Have a great right. night. Enjoy we'll your bike you ride. Yeah. Later. Bye.